Um, I, I'm always in a quandary of what to talk about. And I, and I do things like I say to myself on Sunday mornings at 6 o'clock, you know, I really ought to take a day and sit down and, and make a list of topics and find some references and all that. And that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> yeah. And then I start doing this and that and everything, and the next thing I know. And so today I was talking with Eric, who has returned from one of his trips across country, and uh, it made me think of something to talk about. Um, the last couple of years, I've become very aware of the fact that uh, this idea of normal people and normal upbringing and normal childhood doesn't exist. And I and I used to think that there was, you know, there there was, okay, there's fifty one percent of the people have this kind of experience in their life, so that's our normal, because all all normal means is whatever the average is, right? We can have all the really bad people and all the strange people and everything as long as. 50% of them have this kind of experience. And of course, we joke, us older folks, we talk about Don Reed and Father Knows Best and all these shows where these people came in and they never had any problems. You know, the kid got in trouble at school because he was chewing gum in class. <laughs> Not because he took a gun. <laughs> no, he was chewing gum, you know, so okay, you're grounded for the rest of your life over this kind of stuff. And, and I think about the folks that travel through the center, and I think we we probably get, if we if we look at the years at Buddhist temples, we get more people with more problems than say, I don't know the the market. <laughs> you know, I, I started to say something like, well, you know, people who go to a bar, but no, you know, I think they've got people with lots of problems there. That's why they're in the bar. Um, but I, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, people say, you know, how come we get so many people that come here with problems? I say, well, it's what a temple's for. You know, and I, and I have to keep reminding, sometimes I have to remind myself of that. But, uh, you know, people will talk about, well, this and that and everything, you know. Well, Start with a temple is not a place to start a political campaign. It's not a place to get up on a, a, a political soapbox or even a religious soapbox and start telling people what they're doing wrong. It's supposed to be a place in the old days, it was a place that was quiet. And the gardens that they had, and the koi ponds that they had, and the architecture they had. They were all, the idea behind all of those things was to make a peaceful place for somebody to come. And I get people every once in a while pull down a road, they see the statue and they come in and they go, oh, this is so quiet here. So particularly the people from the city, you know, they're like, I can't believe how quiet it is out here. And that's exactly what a temple is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a quiet place. It's not supposed to be a place of anger and, and high activity and all this other kind of stuff. So, but we get these people coming through and they had horrible childhoods and they had horrible adulthoods and they had horrible experiences in their lives. And, and um, you know, some people have, like with Susan and I, we've had a little bit, I, I don't compare myself to Susan's illness, but you know, a little illness here and there and all of these things. And at, at this ripe old age, I've finally decided that's called life. That's all it is. It's just life. You know, some people trip over the rock and some people don't. Some people are born with talent and some people aren't. Some people have horrible childhoods. You know, if I were to describe my childhood to you, you'd go, wow, you turned out pretty good. I've never described my childhood to anyone because I was too busy getting over it rather than, you know, oh, well, we did this and we did that and we didn't do this and we didn't have that. But I look around and, and most kids don't. I mean, in the town of Lucerne Valley, we have a lot of people that don't have stuff. I was over at the school for their spring fling 
and I'm looking at these folks, and these folks are looking like, God, your life must be rough. This is what I'm thinking. Nobody could be that outrageous if their life wasn't really rough, just the way they were conducting themselves and, you know, and, and, and dressing. You know, the grade school, there were a couple of women there that were half naked. And I'm thinking, what, what are you doing here dressed like that, exposing yourself, you know? But it's just life. We had a fellow that came here uh, in the last couple of three weeks, and he had some really unpleasant life experiences. He went through an injury. He had to have some surgeries. He was extremely bitter. And um, and he told me about all the all all the people and all the institutions that he hated. And I thought, and I'm looking at this guy and. I'm, I'm going to guess. I, I'm not sure. I never asked him how old he was. 40, 45. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know, if this is going to be the rest of your life, you might as well just go sit down under a tree and die. Because you, you have had, you have decided that your life has been so bad up until this time, and nothing's going to make it any better. And I said, uh, I said to him, I said, you know, when he stopped talking, it was just, I said, you, you really need to forgive, you know, the Veterans Administration and the hospitals and because he had an injury in the service. I don't know how he got the injury, but he had a good, pretty bad injury. And uh, I said, you know, you need to forgive, you need to forgive. Oh, Buddha never said anything about forgiving. And it was really hard for me not to just start laughing in his face. <laughs> and uh, he said, oh, no. Now, he'd read some sutras. And he, and the sutras that he read, the Buddha did not say, you must forgive people. Okay? And I'm thinking, all right, how do you even read anything the Buddha said and come out with, you can be hateful and angry at people for the rest of your life because this is a good way to live your life. Which brings me back to the story of the Buddha, which has always caused me a little bit of problem. And I'm talking about the famous story of the Buddha goes into the village with his charioteer, and he had led this extremely protected life, which when I read it when I was 15 years old, I thought, how would you pull that off? Except we know it, it, it really has happened. There's enough historical evidence in different cultures that there have been. You look at Suleiman and people like that. They, they were kept inside the palace and never allowed to go outside the palace and never really experienced life as their people did. They had everything they could possibly want for their whole life, except they were a prisoner of the palace. You know, that's just the way it was. So I thought, and that's how I, okay, so that's what the Buddha's life was like. And then he sneaks out, and he goes into the village, and he, and he, and he sees someone uh, laying in the gutter, dead. And he says to his charioteer, what, what is that? What's, what's going on? And he goes, well, he's dead. Now, the story has been told so many times, it's very formalized. Well, my Lord, this comes to all of us. I'm sure that's what the chariot Chandra said. Oh, my Lord, this comes to all of us. He's a dead guy. <laughs> you know, and the Buddha's going, oh, 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 I don't understand. And he says, well, that's just the way it is. He stepped in front of a bus. Who knows? He's a dead guy. And then they, they come along, and here's, here's somebody that's very ill. And the Buddha once again says, what, what, what's happening here? And Chandra says, well, he's sick. Well, how come I don't know about this? Because your father never lets you see sick people. Anytime anybody even gets a cough, they have to stay home until they get better. So you've never been sick because, you know, remember the years ago, the movie about the kid that lived in the bubble? Yeah, that was the Buddha's life. He lived in this artificial bubble. And then finally he comes along and here's an old person. Kind of looked like Chuck. <laughs> you know. And the Buddha says, my goodness gracious, how did he get white hair? <laughs> For the, those that can't see, because you can only see me, Chuck has beautiful white hair. 
that any country and western singer would die for. <laughs> and so the Buddha says, what is that? And, and Chandra says, yes, he's an old person. Oh, what, what, what happened? He lived a long time. <laughs> you know? And so we get this encounter. And then some of the stories say that he saw a mendicant. He saw a holy man. He saw a monk. Um, I always suspect that because it's not in all the versions, and anytime there's a picture that goes with it, it's always a Buddhist monk. <laughs> By the way, we didn't exist. In that. <laughs> so I, I doubt seriously that he saw a holy person. I think probably what he saw was just life. He saw what happens to everybody. Everybody gets sick, everybody gets old, and Eventually everybody dies and he went back and it really was disturbing to him because all of this had been kept from him. Now we all know that sooner or later he was going to have to deal with it. But it's kind of like the spoiled child, which is exactly what the Buddha was. You know, you get a spoiled child, they go through school, the parents go in. Anytime they don't do something right, the parent goes in and tells the school they're wrong. Okay. And, uh, you know, do I sound like a retired school teacher? You know, you know because, the, you know, the kid came in and said all kinds of nasty things to the teacher. And, no, I'm not going to do your homework, and I don't really care, and I don't have to do it. And so you call the parent up, and the parent goes, why are you picking on my child? <laughs> well, I haven't done any homework for two months. Well, stop picking on my child, or I'll have you in court, you know. And uh, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, the more problem the child is, the more the parent knows about suing. And they don't want to say that, you know. They, they don't understand that you actually have to pay a lawyer to sue somebody. I always laugh at them, you know, because they're standing there, I'll have you in court. I'll sue you because you made my, you know, you suspended my child for a day because he brought a knife to school. What's wrong with you? That's his knife. He should be able to bring it to school. So... I'm looking at this and then I'm thinking, okay, where is this perfect existence? And this perfect existence, even when you try to make it, doesn't, doesn't exist. Because on the other side, if you could, if you had all the resources that you could raise children so that they would never, ever have a problem, now you've got the problem of the kid that doesn't know how to deal with life. So where do we find this, this magic? There is no magic. Everybody goes through life collecting problems. And so we read in the Dharmapada, which, by the way, in the Dharmapada, this fellow that I was talking to said, why did the Buddha ever say that? He said, well, the Buddha said the only way to deal with hate is to give love. And if you give hate, all you do is perpetuate the hate. And, and we can just simply say, if you give anger, all you do is perpetuate the anger. And so you have to do something different. You, and you can't get even. Getting even doesn't solve any problems either. Okay? And so we come to Zen, and Zen, one of our basic teachings is letting go. Okay? So that happened, and it wasn't a good experience, and you're on... You're not really happy about it, and somebody said something, or somebody did something, or somebody took something, and so now what are you going to do? Well, the Buddha would say, you have a choice. You can either be unhappy, or you can let go. So this fellow comes to the Buddha, the stories in the Dharmapada, which is a nice little book. If you didn't, if you were going to buy a Buddhist book, and uh, you wanted to get one that was not too expensive, because there's, oh, I think in our library we have five or six different translations. Some of them cost ridiculous amounts of money, and I have no idea why. There's no copyright on this stuff. Okay, it's only been around for 2,500 years. But Foley comes to the Buddha and said, my life is crap. And the Buddha said, well, me too. And he says, no, you don't understand. Everything has gone wrong in my life. My life. People don't treat me fairly. I don't get what I deserve. I'm not very good looking. Why did that happen? 
You know, he says, I believe in karma, but still, why should I be so ugly? And he just went through all of these things that was wrong in his life. He says, you know, I loved a woman and she loved me for a while. And then one day I came home and she was gone. And he just went to think of everything that goes wrong in human life. This guy went through all of this kind of stuff. And the Buddha, when he finally got done, the Buddha said, okay, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to let go of all that. All right, you've got all these people you hate. You have to let go of that. Well, I don't, what, what do you mean? And you have all of these injuries that you've been, you, you just have to let go of it. You're, you're not going to get redress. You could spend lifetimes trying to get people to come forward and say, yes, I was, I did this to him. I did that to him. I took this. I said, you just have to let go of all of that stuff. And, and the guy says, I don't want to let go of all that stuff. I want to get even. And the Buddha said, okay, let me ask you. If Somebody shot you with an arrow. What would you do? Would you go looking for the guy that shot you? Or would you go looking for a doctor? And the guy goes, no, you don't understand. Who goes, no, I understand exactly. Which one are you going to do? Because I can tell you right now, if you go looking for the guy that shot you, you'll probably bleed to death before you find him. So you probably should go looking for a doctor. And the doctor will remove the arrow and put a bandage on there and help you with these things. And as you tell the doctor, this is my words, as you tell the doctor, I gotta go find that guy, the doctor will go, no, 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 you need to rest. You need to take it easy, you need to heal. Don't worry about the guy that shot you. And so that very, very basic message so when people come here, I repeat the words of the Buddha and are summarily ignored. Okay, that stuff happens. So you need to look, no, I don't need to let go. I need to go out and get them. I want to pound in their face because they did this thing. Well, having been in that position, there is absolutely no satisfaction. It's like, I always think about the thing, all of us have done it. It's, it's a joke in our culture. You know, somebody comes with a, with a sharp tongue and says something really cutting to you, to the where you just can't reply. They just get you. And you're walking away and you think of what you should have said. Well, I can tell you the great secret. If you had thought of what you should have said, when you had a chance to say it, it wouldn't have made anything any better. Because what happens now is two people are pissed off instead of one. That's all that's accomplished. But it's so hard for people to accept the idea that you don't have to get even, that you don't have to prove anything. I went to, I told Eric this story because I'm trying to get rid of it. It's really bugging me. <laughs> Last week we rented a rototiller because we had this horrible situation in our garden. It was like out of a monster movie where crabgrass had come and you couldn't get it out, no matter what you did. I had volunteers from the VA over here digging on this stuff, big, healthy, strong young men passing out on me, trying to dig up this crabgrass that I'd let them take over the garden. And so last week they said, okay, that's it, that's all we can do, five hours of digging. And uh, they got about 40% of it done. And, and one of them said, have you ever thought about getting a rototiller? And I said, yeah, matter of fact, just before you called me, I had decided to go rent a rototiller and uh, see if I could tear this thing up. I'd even talked to Chuck about it a few weeks ago. You know, I saw Chuck's garden, by the way. All of you, if you get a chance, you need to go by and see Chuck's garden. Because Chuck's garden really ought to be in Sunset Magazine. Eric, you ought to take pictures of his garden. You ought to submit it to Sunset Magazine. He's got, it is so clean, you know, that it makes me feel guilty. I haven't looked at our garden today because I saw Chuck's garden yesterday. <laughs> I know. I, oh, yeah. You know, he's got a little squash plant and he's got this nice little mulch around it. You know, 
I got a squash plant and I kick a little dirt around him. <laughs> so no, he's just it's it's out of like a magazine. And really you could probably sell some pictures. Do a little interview with him. So how long have you been gardening, sir? You look very, very old with your white hair. Yeah, we want his picture in sunset. And I'll, so we got out there and we did this thing. And uh, I paid for this rototiller. We went and picked it up, got these big strong guys, and threw it in the back of the truck, and we came back here. And we worked from uh, 9 to 2. I uh, was about ready to just fall over. And these guys, all these guys, big, healthy, strong, like him, big, healthy, strong guys. And they're going, oh, my God, what have you done to us? Why are we out here? You know? And we finally got all this crabgrass up. And we couldn't get this thing to start. We got here, and they're taking turns pulling it, you know, and their arm would seize up, and the next guy. And I said, you know, I've got a little starter fluid that I bought for something else. Let me go get that ether. And we took the air cleaner off, which was just clogged. And, and you know, and I pulled a spark plug, and, blah, 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 and then I, I put it in there, and then we did it. And, and finally, we got it started. And I said, don't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of times, they did it. And this was the most miserable experience I've ever had with a piece of garden machine. Because, man, if it stopped, it just it took forever. And I had the spark plug out of there, and I checked. There was no compression. You know, so those of you that know my background, I know a little bit about engines. <laughs> so when we took it back, the, the manager came out of the local hardware store and said, what you need? And I said, well, I'm returning the roller tiller. So what you need? I said, well, I guess I need to sign the piece of paper that you charged me, you know, for the roller tiller. Because we have an account. And I said, by the way. I said, there's a pretty good chance you need to put a set of rings in that rototiller. So that's it. That's what you say. And I go, yeah. Okay. And you know, I said, that's really. And I mean, this popped out of my mouth. I said, no, that's what a certified master mechanic is telling me. I've only been one for 30 years. I said, they probably need. Valves aren't bad. I, I, I used to teach this stuff, you know. So. You go, <laughs> and I'm thinking, wait a minute. Are you really talking to me like this? See, so you think you got your act together, and then you go in and some snotty kid, because he's only probably 40 years old, and, you know, <laughs> and he's telling me, well, no, it doesn't mean anything. And when we pulled in, we gave it to the guy in the yard. And the guy in the yard, we told him, he said, boy, that, the guy said, that thing doesn't want to start. And the guy said, well, I don't know why. You know, I changed the oil on it. Like, that's going to make any difference. <laughs> and he goes over there and he goes, blah, 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 blah. he says, well, you're right. It doesn't want to start. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, we figured that one out. <laughs> so it's so funny because I think, you know, you, you make the mistake of thinking you have your act together. And that guy really irritated me because, you know, I always talk about monks have to be really careful about taking themselves too seriously. And I thought I was really had my act together with that. And I never realized how seriously I took myself when it came to things like motors and stuff. So another week of telling this story, I could probably put that down and not worry about it anymore. It is always a process of just letting go. Because there's no way you can fix the problem by getting easy, by hitting the person, or coming up with a magic cutting thing. Boy, I'm going to say this to them, and they're going to feel so bad about themselves, and so I'm going to, but I'm going to feel better about myself because they feel bad about themselves. So the Buddha, all his life, this is what he was teaching. He was teaching, just let go. Let go of the anger. There is nothing more unhappy than an angry person. And I can tell you this because you ask anybody that has gone through a real bout of anger, ask them how their stomach feels. Their body really, really doesn't like this experience. 
So anger is something the Japanese went and they decided to make it a precept. Okay, it's not in the everybody else doesn't have that precept. We have things like don't kill people. That's a pretty good precept. <laughs> don't take things that don't belong to you. You know, don't get drunk. And the Japanese said, well, we're going to add, don't, you know, I will never get angry. I love that. I will never get angry. Really? <laughs> so that's how it works. I just go, see, I took these precepts. I just say I'll never get angry and I, I don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> that's wonderful. Let's see. I'll never get old. I go, oh, that, that, how's that going to work? I'll never get sick. Uh, they didn't work out. I tested and they didn't work out. But the simple thing is, the medicine is there. And the medicine is, just let go. The medicine is, somebody was a stop to you, just forgive them. That's all you have to do. But you really have to forgive them. And I think I'll go back next week to the hardware store and say, hey, you know when you were a real snot to me? I forgive you. <laughs> oh, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> but we just have to keep practicing letting go. That's all. And eventually one day you wake up and you realize, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. 